So my name's Abby. I'm a PhD student at JCU in Cairns, and I'm going to be talking to you today about my first PhD experiment. So my PhD is looking at how herbivores can structure seagrass meadows and uh, impact ecosystem service delivery. Um, but the first experiment is looking at interactions between herbivore groups and how they can structure meadows. So you probably all feel like you're experts in seagrass in the GVR, based on the amount you've heard about it over the last few days. Um, but it's where I'm working, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to it. So seagrasses in the Great Barrier Reef are really diverse. We're in the most diverse um, bioregion for seagrasses, and we've got over 10 species in the GVR. They cover a really large area, so in fact they cover a larger area than we have of reef in the Great Barrier Reef, hence uh, maybe we should rename it to the Great Seagrass uh, World Heritage Area instead of a uh, barrier reef. They're really important for the reef in terms of habitat linkages, nutrient subsidies, and um, the animals moving between both habitats. They provide a whole range of ecosystem services that we've been hearing a lot about at this conference. And they are a food source to a wide range of mega herbivores, um, which is what we've been hearing about and what I'm going to tell you a bit more about. So why are we interested in the fate of seagrass productivity in the tropics um, and in the Great Barrier Reef specifically? Well, if you go to a temperate environment like Rob did and sent me this photo, uh, you'll see a lot of seagrass rack washed up on the shore. Um, whereas if you come to tropical environments, if you come to Green Island in the Great Barrier Reef, you won't see quite as much. In fact, we don't really see very much seagrass rack washed up on the shores uh, in the GBR. And so there's not as much seagrass entering the detrital food chain as there is in these temperate environments. So we suspect that this could be, in part at least, because it's being consumed by herbivores. We've got a, a few different groups of herbivores in the Great Barrier Reef that I'm looking at. I'll start with the mega herbivores, who we've heard a lot about already over the past couple of talks. We've got turtles and dugongs in the GBR. Uh, and as we've heard, they can consume a lot of seagrass. They're highly mobile and they can move between meadows as well. We've also got the macro herbivores, so urchins, fish, and larger invertebrates. And we really don't know much about these in the tropics in general, but specifically in the GBR, we know very little about how much seagrass they're consuming. So they can live and feed in the seagrass meadows that, that they're living in, so they're eating and feeding in the same place, essentially, sometimes. The last group are the mesoherbivores, so amphipods, isopods, and gastropods. And these live on the seagrass blades and primarily consume the epiphytes that are growing on the blades. So all of these groups can act to structure the seagrass meadows in a few different ways, which has kind of been touched on already in the first talk, but um, in terms of mega herbivores. But I'll just talk to you about a few of the key ways that herbivores can structure seagrass meadows. So first up, community composition. They, by creating a disturbance, they can cause the community to shift to a faster growing species, which also has implications for the diversity of seagrass species. They can remove epiphytes. So like I said, the mesograzers can directly remove epiphytes by consuming them. But the other herbivores remove epiphytes too by um, consuming the older leaves, which are more covered in epiphytes. So this can benefit the seagrass because these epiphytes are going to shade them. So reducing that shading. And then in this picture, it probably looks familiar from the last uh, talk, or the last couple of talks, these are the dugong feeding trails through the meadow. This is an intertidal meadow seen from a helicopter. But we've heard that um, herbivores, especially mega herbivores, can consume large amounts of seagrass biomass, depending on their size and the feeding strategy. They can also influence shoot density and height. So by cropping the blades, uh, they can reduce the shoot height. And by consuming the whole plant, they can change the shoot density. So that's just a few of the key ways that herbivores can influence seagrass meadows. So with the diversity of seagrass species and the diversity of herbivores that we've got in the GBR, I wanted to look at how these can act together to structure seagrass meadows. So I'm interested in the interactions between herbivores. Not these kind of interactions, but the interactions that they have in structuring the seagrass meadow itself. So I'm looking at how much seagrass each of these different groups uh, can consume or uh, what their impact is on meadow structure and how they can act together to influence meadow structure. And I did this by using exclusion experiments, which ran for three months. I did this at two locations in the GBR, which 
the first of which is Gladstone, which has been mentioned already this morning. Um, it's at the southern end of the GBR. It's a very industrial location, but it's also got large areas of intertidal seagrass and large populations of mega herbivores. I also conducted this experiment at Green Island, which is off the coast of Cairns. It's a really diverse seagrass meadow. You can see the seagrass here is long and lush. It's really important for tourism, and there's a large population of herbivorous fish and of turtles here, so a kind of different environments that I was looking at. And these were my main exclusion treatments. So I had large steel mega herbivore exclusion cages uh, to keep the largest herbivores out, modified crab pots covered in monofilament mesh, which kept out the mesograzers as well, and then lastly, carbaryl deterrent blocks, which were slow release um, and deterred the mesograzers. So those were the key treatments, or the, the kind of key types of exclusion, and these are all of my experimental treatments. So along the top, you can see those that I've just mentioned, and plus the control plots that we pegged out. Um, and then in the middle here are my procedural controls, so a fish frame and a plaster block. And then on the outside edges, those are the treatments looking at the interactions. So the only uh, interaction it's not possible to get is to exclude fish and allow the mega herbivores in, but the rest of those combinations are, are covered off there. Um, the layout, I laid this out in three separate sites at each location, which are a couple of hundred meters apart, with three replicates um, of each treatment per site laid out randomly in a grid. So this experimental layout will become important later when I tell you about um, my results, so just to keep it in mind. When I set up the experiment, um, I measured, I did some shoot counts and then went back monthly and looked at canopy height. Um, at the end of the experiment, I took three cores from every plot. Um, and I haven't actually managed to be able to go through all of these cores at the moment. A lot of them are still sat in the freezer. Um, so I'm going to present to you today the, the main story of the data and my canopy height data from across my key treatments. So really to look at the interactions, I need more information from the cores. So I'm just going to present to you the key treatments and my field observations. Um, with more information to come on these cores. So I'll start with Green Island. So the seagrass at Green Island looked look like this for much of the experiment, really long and lush inside and outside the cages at all of the um, sites. I should just say at Green Island, I wasn't able to keep those um, fish exclusion cages out because they got fouled up so, so quickly. Um, I had to remove them, but I have been back in the last two months to look at herbivory by fish at Green Island, just cleaning the cages very regularly. So I will be able to understand that interaction, but just not as part of this experiment. So that left these cages and the carbaryl blocks. So the seagrass looked long and lush like this. We went back every two weeks to check it, um, and we didn't notice any obvious changes really. Um, but then after eight weeks, we did site one and we did site two and couldn't really see anything. And then we arrived at site three, uh, and it looked like this. So you could see from the surface that the, there were just squares of seagrass where the cages were. Um, so obviously there'd been some kind of a big disturbance that had caused the loss of seagrass outside my cages. And we strongly suspected that turtles were to blame for this, but we couldn't really be sure. So I left a GoPro. And um, you can see that the, the turtles are consuming the seagrass uh, next to the cages. So the, the turtles seem to be the culprit for this loss of seagrass. And it's interesting because we kept going back to this site for the next couple of months, sorry, for the next month before I uh, took the experiment out. And this bear patch got a bit barer, but it didn't really get very bigger. So it was a very localized feeding event. And the turtles did seem to be keeping and com coming back and feeding on whatever edge they could access. Um, but they didn't branch out into the broader meadow, so very specific, as we heard earlier with the, uh, with the turtle grazing. And you can see this in the shoot height data that I've got. So site one and two, no real change. Um, and site three, all of a sudden, a big drop off in shoot height in the control plot compared to the mega herbivore cage. The picture at Gladstone was slightly different, so I did manage to keep these fish cages out in Gladstone, and uh, we noticed a more gradual change. So it seems that the, by the end of the experiment, you could see that the, the grass visually seemed longer inside both of those exclusion types. 
So it seems that the herbivory here is more perhaps constant across the meadow, and you can really notice the difference once you release the seagrass from this herbivory. Um, the data at Gladstone is a bit more complicated, so that's just the three key treatments. Um, I'm hoping when I go through my cores, I'll be able to get a much clearer picture, but you can see in ev at every site, the um, control plots were, had the shortest shoot height compared to those exclusion treatments. So it, we're definitely starting to see um, the impact of this grazing, and once we, I look at the biomass, I should get a much clearer picture. So these preliminary findings just show the impact that um, mega herbivore grazing can have. It can be quite dramatic uh, on the seagrass meadows in the GBR, and that there's a difference between the feeding strategies of the mega herbivores between these two different locations. At Green Island, it was very localized, whereas at Gladstone, it seemed to be more grazing across the board and across all of my sites, and indeed the meadow as a whole. Um, so some further analysis will allow me to investigate the interactions between herbivore groups, which was obviously one of my key aims. So um, I'm very interested to get that data and have a look at it. Um, but it's, it's interesting for management, and like a lot of people have said, understanding the plant system, the plant herbivore system as a whole is really important to understand how your seagrass meadow is doing and how your herbivore population is doing as well and how you can best manage that. Thank you. This is really nice uh, to see. Okay, can I have uh, see one uh, the, the slide with your movie? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, you see uh, a tag on the on the left flipper. Do you yes. know more about this turtle? Uh, no, I I I watched this video so many times, and then all of a sudden I noticed that there's a tag on it. Um, and so it will be worth, if I can, trying to see the number on the tag, because I know that the people that do do the tagging. So, yeah, that's definitely, I need to look and try and find out more about this turtle for sure, yeah. yeah sometimes <laughs> they are scrubbing the, the GoPro. So yeah, yeah. They, you get and a real, you can just read the number. <laughs> yes, and this turtle came back so many times throughout the course of when I left this GoPro down. So, yeah, I'll uh, try and have a look for the number, yeah. I agree. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. 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 Uh, Gary. that actually opened up the meadow for the turtles or do you think there were you know it's the only one that shows grazing of yeah three it's replicas? yes so I had the um, the three replicates with the, the mega herbivore cage and then I also had the ones that had carbaryl inside so I did have six cages out um, but yeah perhaps that meadow was a little bit more patchy at the start but not, not really they were all very uniform um, and we did see a lot more turtles there, so I'm, I think that it was probably more than just one turtle, but I don't know why um, it would just be in that area. I think it'd be interesting to maybe use drones and see how the turtles are moving, if they're moving around with these localized feeding patches, and if perhaps it's somewhere they've been before and they were waiting for it to kind of grow back and then move in again, perhaps something like that. But yeah, there's nothing obvious um, as to why, why they'd pick that particular spot. In fact, it's the, the spot that's nearest to the swimming beach at Green Island, which is where all the tourists are, um, and a lot of boats are coming in and out right next to this particular site. I mean, they're all quite close because they're 200 meters apart, but yeah, this one was closest to the swimming area. Yeah. Very nice talk. Um, I'm just wondering, after you've finished your experiment and you take away the um, cages, are you then looking at what happens Know, how the grazing pressure changes um, over time and how quickly it gets back to looking like what the surrounding area is? We, I visited the site last time, uh, or, or most recently, I, I took the cages out probably early December and I visited again in February um, and you could still see the longer patches of seagrass but yeah, the, it seemed that the grazing pressure had stopped and the, the seagrass was starting to recover in between the patches. Um, so yeah, in terms of our, sort of casual observations, yes, we've been going back and having a look and taking some photos, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.